Hi, I'm Dan Crane. I'm a professor in the biology department at Wright State University in Dayton, Ohio. And in this video, I'd like to talk with you for the next 50 minutes or so about how it is that subjectivity can creep into the interpretation of DNA testing results. Like all the videos in this series, the PowerPoint slides associated with this video, as well as uh, quite a few other uh, resources, uh, articles, and things of that nature, are available at uh, bioforensics.com. Uh, with that out of the way, let's just get right to work here and start talking some more about DNA profiling. And so let's look at this first slide and uh, see if anybody who's seen these videos before recognizes it. It's one that's shown up in a number of the videos that are part of this series. And this particular one is a DNA profile as it shows up uh, for a reference sample. Uh, as is the case with some DNA testing results, they're very easy to interpret, in some sense very black and white. There's no question here as to whether or not there is a 16 or a 17 peak at the first locus in the blue. Uh, it's pretty obvious. And there's also no question but that there is not a 13 or a 12 in that particular DNA profile. And sometimes with a DNA profile like this, uh, interpreting the testing results can really be very easy. So easy, in fact, that there really isn't any question as to whether or not an individual might or might not match this particular DNA profile. But not every evidence sample looks like a reference sample. And in fact, uh, very often they look quite a bit different. So this next slide shows you an electropherogram that was generated from an actual evidence sample. This is an evidence sample uh, from a case that comes out of the state of California. I'll tell you a little bit of background about the case and then I'll walk you through the electropherogram. Um, the case itself, uh, again, originates from California. The defendant in the case uh, was accused of improper sexual contact with a, a female visitor to a party that he was hosting. The background for the rest of the story is this, is that the day after the party had taken place, the, uh, the woman uh, thought that maybe her foundation garment, her bra, wasn't quite fitting the way it was supposed to have, hadn't been uh, put on quite the way that she would have normally done it, and that made her think that maybe something inappropriate had happened during the course of the party. Now, by her own admission and her own recollection, she didn't have any clear recollection of what had transpired at the party. Uh, apparently, alcohol and perhaps drugs were involved. But uh, she mentioned this to some police officers, and they, in turn, uh, took some DNA evidence from her. They took cotton swabs and swabbed her breast and used that to generate a DNA profile. The DNA profile results that were generated are what you see on the slide here. And you'll notice that there is only a blue electropherogram. There is nothing in green or yellow, as you might typically expect with DNA profiling results. And that's because, uh, for this particular case, that's all that they were able to get useful information from. The electropherograms for the green and the yellow uh, lines were essentially flat lines and, and didn't contain any useful information. So that makes this a pretty interesting and useful case for us to talk about because in this one nutshell here is all the information that the crime lab had to work with. And let me also mention to you at the very onset here that none of the peaks that we're seeing on this electropherogram correspond to alleles that the victim herself had. So it seems as if we're looking at what might be DNA that was foreign to the potential victim in this particular case. Now, at this particular party, there was the female who thinks she may have been a victim of a sexual assault, and three males. The, the male that we're considering here as a suspect is Tom, and let's see what we think about Tom's circumstances and how, how well his DNA profile might match this particular evidence profile. So let me draw your attention again to this electropherogram, and let's talk about what we see here. For this electropherogram, we again have just information at the three blue loci, the D3 locus, the VWA locus, and the FGA locus. 
And notice that what we're seeing here is that the computer software that we've talked about in other videos has labeled each of the peaks that you see on the electropherogram with a blue number in a box. That is the name of the peak, the name of the allele that the computer software has identified. And immediately under the green boxes is a red box that contains within it a number. That number is a measure of the height of the peak on the vertical axis. So this 17, for instance, is 107 RFUs tall. RFU is short for relative fluorescent units, but is again just a measure of the height of the peak up over the baseline here. So let's look and see what we can find in terms of what's present at this uh, evidence sample. At the D3 locus, you'll notice that surely there is a 17 that's been labeled, uh, and there's also a 12 that's been labeled. And again, the question at hand here is, is can this suspect, Tom, be excluded as a possible contributor to this evidence sample? Now notice, in Tom's reference sample, we know that he is a homozygote at the D3 locus. He has two copies of the 17 allele, so 17, 17. And again, this comes from his reference sample. So there's really no question as to what his DNA profile is at that particular location. If there was a question, there's a simple solution, and that is just go back to Tom, get more of his DNA, and generate his reference DNA profile again. So again, we can accept without question that at the D3 locus, he is a 1717. But let's look again at the evidence sample, and again, surely we see the 17, but notice that the computer software is labeled also a 12. Now, I think at this point in this series of lectures, people should be pretty comfortable with the fact that Tom doesn't have a 12 to give. Um, if there really is a 12 at the D3 locus in the evidence sample, that is not something that Tom could have contributed. So, what do we do about this 12? Now, let me tell you, I've given uh, talks on many occasions and often have used this particular slide uh, to talk with audiences about what we can say about that particular 12 allele. Many of the times that I give talks, there are two groups of uh, people who work in crime laboratories or prosecutors. And they'll look at this electropherogram and Tom's reference alleles, and they'll tell me, wait a minute here, why are you even talking about that 12? The 12 isn't really there. The 12 is too short relative to the 17, right? It's only 47 tall rather than 107 tall. If the 12 came with the 17, they should have about the same height because the heights of these peaks are generally related to how much DNA was present in the sample at the start of the amplification. They'll also tell me that the 12's shape doesn't look quite right. Notice how it's relatively short and squat compared to the 17 peak, or this other 17, for instance. It's short, it's wide, it's asymmetrical. It's a little bit steeper on the uptake than it is on the downtake. There are lots of things about that 12 that don't look quite right. Its height, its shape, most people working in crime laboratories, when they hear me talk about this slide in the context of talking about the suspect here, Tom, will tell me that the 12, in a word, is noise. It's not signal. It's something that we really shouldn't pay any attention to. It's a trace evidence sample, and in such a circumstance, very often we see high levels of background noise. And quite simply, the 12 isn't really very reliable. The 17 is real. Tom has a 17. The 12 probably isn't there. Don't worry about the fact that Tom doesn't have a 12. Tom can't be excluded because we see the 17, that's real, the 12 isn't. So let's move along in the electropherogram. Let's look at the VWA locus. Here, the electropherogram is showing us a 15 and a 17, and sure enough, we see that in Tom's reference profile, he too has a 15 and a 17. So in a word, we would say he matches, right? We've talked about that in other videos in this series as well. So we can move along quickly then to the third locus, the FGA locus, and what we see there is that Tom in his reference sample has a 2525. Again, he's a homozygote at this particular location. And sure enough, in the evidence sample, there is a prominent 25 allele that the computer software has labeled for us. It's 157 RFUs tall, 
good shape, that looks like a peak. Tom could well have been the source of a peak that looks like that. He has a 25 to give. But I'm sure many of you have also noticed that there's another peak at the FGA locus that the computer software seems to have had some trouble working with. Notice this larger peak here, broad, right? Uh, and the computer software hasn't put a number to name the peak. It's put this OL allele question mark designation. In fact, it's done it two times. OL is short for off ladder allele. And what that means in simple terms is that this peak doesn't fit quite right in the spot that you would expect a 22 or a 23 allele to be. It's somewhere in between them. It sort of straddles those two specific spots on the ladder that the software looks to to determine what name to give this peak. And I'll tell you this too. DNA analysts, those working in crime labs, prosecutors, would very quickly tell you that that is not really an allele. There's a technical artifact that's in play here, a peak that is broader relative to high, the way it is in this particular case, uh, is one that you see very frequently in looking at electropherograms. In fact, on average, about one out of every three electropherograms will have such a peak. Those types of peaks are called blobs. Yeah, that is the technical term for it, B-L-O-B. But a blob is a non-reproducible artifact. Uh, there's some question as to what gives rise to blobs. Some blobs may be caused by one thing. Other blobs may be caused by others. Could be that a piece of dust drifted in front of the capillary tube in the camera uh, during that point in the collection. Maybe a crystal of urea moved through the capillary tube. Again, we're not always sure what causes a blob, and in fact, it's not even that important usually to figure out the nature, the cause of the blob. The thing that's necessary is to be able to look at it and say, yes, that's a blob, that's an artifact. It's not reproducible. It's not the sort of thing you would expect to see in the same spot in the reference sample for a suspect. So again, it's essentially just an artifact. Don't pay any attention to it. And what are we left with then? Well, for this particular evidence sample, we see the 25 at the FGA locus. We see an artifact that we can discount as a blob uh, that precedes it. That's a good match to the defendant or the suspect here, Tom. Uh, there's a 15-17 at VWA, again, a good match to suspect Tom. And we see here a 17 that he could have been the source of and a 12 that might have been uh, just a technical artifact, a bit of noise associated with the background. So at the end of the day, the question that we're asking is, can Tom be excluded as a possible contributor? And the answer, as you see in the slide, is no. And the reason that he can't be excluded is that his alleles are in fact showing up on the electropherogram that we have. And the things that aren't his alleles can be dismissed as technical artifacts, either baseline noise or things like these blobs. So at this point, we find ourselves saying it doesn't seem as if Tom can be excluded as a possible contributor to this particular evidence sample. And the question starts to become, well, how impressed should we be that Tom can't be excluded? Now, from other videos in this series, you'll know that there are statistical approaches that can be used to attach a statistical weight to a, the fact that an individual matches a particular evidence sample. But before we start talking about what specific statistic to apply and how impressed we should be, I want to ask you to help me along here with a little bit of an experiment. Uh, at this point, I want you to forget everything that you know about Tom. So now that you've put Tom out of your head, I want you to think about another suspect. Let's talk about Dick, and let's see what we think about Dick as being a possible contributor to this evidence sample. Because I'll tell you this, sometimes when I use this slide for talks, uh, I start with this slide. I start by talking about Dick and not by talking about Tom at all and uh, take the audience through just with Dick in their thoughts as we're considering the evidence sample. So, Let's look at Dick. With his reference sample, you can see he has a 12 and a 17. The 17 is clearly there in the evidence sample, so he's a match for that particular allele. But a question might arise when we start talking about the 12. Dick clearly has a 12 in his reference sample. There's no question about that. But what do we feel about the 12 that we see in the evidence sample? Someone might argue that that peak is too small. It's only 47 tall. 
Many laboratories don't pay attention to a peak unless it's 50 or taller to begin with, and so going below 50 in and of itself might raise some concerns. The shape of the peak may seem a little bit off. It's kind of wide relative to its height, and it's asymmetrical and kind of jagged. It looks like it might be part of the background noise. How impressed should we be that 12 is in the evidence sample and also in DIC? Now, when I give this talk to groups of prosecutors and crime lab uh, employees, uh, they'll tell me at this point, quite often that the 12 really is there. Right? We have to remember that this is a trace evidence sample. With trace evidence samples, when you're dealing with very small quantities of starting material, very often the heights of the peaks are very small. And in addition to being very small, small peaks often have some odd features to their shape. Sometimes they're too wide, sometimes they're asymmetrical. And further, the difference in the height of the peak between the 12 and the 17 is also something that you might expect to find with a small sample size due to what's known as stochastic effects. Random sampling uh, at the beginning stages of the PCR amplification might have simply hit on the 17 and caused it to be amplified more than the 12 was. And so that could explain the disparity in the heights between those two peaks. At the end of the day, I've had analysts working in crime labs who know nothing about Tom, again, but just about Dick. They'll tell me that they're actually heartened by what they see with respect to that 12 allele. They'll tell me that that to them is uh, a good indication that we're not looking here at some sort of stray contamination of Dick's DNA because clearly it's present in a very small quantity and it's consistent with what you might find from a breast swab. So, can we exclude Dick as a possible contributor based on what we see in the electropherogram? Well, many analysts have told me, quite simply, no. You can't exclude Dick because the 12 may well be real and it may be small and misshapen simply because we're dealing with a small amount of starting material. So let's move along further through the electropherogram and see how things play out for Dick in the rest of this electropherogram. At VWA, he has a 15 and a 17, and again, we see the 15 and the 17, no question about whether or not they're present. So he's a match for that locus. And let's look now at the FGA locus. Here, we see at the 25 allele that could have come from Dick, and we also see a 20 allele. And now remember, this is a blob that we had looked at uh, before. Uh, the computer's not sure what to call it calls it an off-lateral allele. But it happens that the blob is right where a 20 allele would have appeared. It actually straddles the region that a 20 would have been. But people working in crime laboratories, when confronted with this electropherogram and Dick's reference profile, have told me, you can't exclude Dick as a possible contributor uh, at the FGA locus. That blob may well be masking the 20 allele that could have come from an, an individual like Dick. So now the blob is effectively a dead spot on the test results. We don't know what's happening there. There might be a 20 allele, there might not be a 20 allele. The blob is masking whatever's happening there from our view. And at the end of the day, Let's talk about how do you interpret this. Is Dick somebody that we can exclude as a possible contributor? Well, the blob might be hiding the 20. You can't exclude him because we don't see the 20. The 12 might be actually uh, there, just small because of the uh, small amount of starting material. And at the end of the day, the relevant question is, can Dick be excluded as a possible contributor? And the answer to that question is no, he can't. The 12 may simply be uh, a manifestation of the small amount of starting material that we have, <clears throat> and the 20 at the FGA locus could be masked by that blob. So, I think at this point, you can appreciate that something interesting is going on. We have two people, Tom and Dick, both with different DNA profiles, and yet arguments could be made such that both of them could be included as possible contributors to this unchanged evidence sample. How much worse could it get? Well, let me have you look at this one more slide. Now you can remember, if you like, what you know about Tom and Dick. 
and let's start talking about Harry. I'll bet that many of you watching this video anticipated there would be a Harry. I had already told you there were three guys at the party, uh, and I think whenever you hear about a Tom and a Dick, you have to expect a Harry won't be far behind. Let's talk about Harry. I'm giving you here on this slide Harry's uh, reference DNA profile. You can see at the D3 locus, he's a 1417. We've talked a lot now about the 17. It's really there, no question about that. The 14, well, look, the computer hasn't done anything to label a 14. That little blip there on the electropherogram is where a 14 would be. I don't think anybody would like to make an argument that that, four, that, that little blip corresponds to a 14. So what do we say in such a circumstance where an individual has an allele in their reference sample that you don't see on the evidence sample. Well, here's what might be said. Bear in mind, again, that this is a trace evidence sample. It's originating from probably a very small number of cells that were obtained during that breast swab. And the 14 may actually have been associated with the sample and yet failed to be detected because there was such a small amount of material to start with. There's actually a name for such a circumstance. That's called allelic dropout. The smaller the quantity of DNA present with a sample, the greater the risk that allelic dropout has occurred. And what that means is that sometimes when an individual has an allele in their reference sample that you don't see in an evidence sample, that doesn't necessarily mean they're not contributing to the evidence sample. It might simply mean that this phenomenon known as allelic dropout has occurred. So can you exclude Harry as a possible contributor? The answer is no. The 14 may be absent not because it's not there, but rather because allelic dropout has occurred. And if you look further along the line in Harry's electropherogram and his reference profile, he has a 15-17 at VWA as well and a 20-25 at FGA, so he has the same issues in play that we had talked about with Dick. And at the end of this discussion, what can we say? Can Harry be excluded as a possible contributor? The answer, no. At least not if you can invoke this phenomenon known as allelic dropout. And it does get invoked fairly frequently in forensic DNA profiling contexts. So, is that the end of the story? Well, I tell you what, there is one other thing to consider, and that is how do we deal with the circumstance, or how do we interpret the circumstance, where a suspect has uh, doesn't have an allele which does show up in the electropherogram and I was at a loss w for a fourth male name to add to our list here but let me draw your attention now to a hypothetical Sally and talk about her for a little bit. Sally uh, has a 12 and a 17. She has the same issues that Dick did with respect to the D3 locus but here's where things get interesting for Sally. Uh, Sally is a homozygote for the 15 allele at the VWA locus, and sure enough, there is a 15 present in the evidence sample, but there is also an unequivocal 17. Sally does not have a 17 to contribute, yet we see that there is a 17 present. What if we consider that this evidence sample we've been talking about isn't from just one person, not just one person licked the, the woman's breast. What if there's the possibility that there were actually two lickers and that we're actually looking here at DNA that comes from two people? One person like Sally, for instance, that may have given us the 15. Another person who has a 1717 at the VWA locus to add to the mix or possibly somebody who's a 1517 mixed in with Sally's 1515. If this sample that we've been talking about might be a mixture, then we still can't exclude Sally as a possible contributor. Her 20 allele at the FGA locus may be masked by a blob. Allelic dropout might account for the absence of her 22. At the end of the day, can you exclude Sally? The short answer is no. So let's think and take stock of where we're at. We have a single electropherogram that we've been talking about now in this past 10 minutes or so. That hasn't changed at all. What's changed is we've considered whether or not four different individuals might have been a contributor to that particular sample. 
And the answers come back, even though these four people had different DNA profiles, the answer keeps coming back no. We can't exclude them as possible contributors to the mixture. There's the possibility that allelic dropout has occurred. There's a possibility that the sample is a mixture. There's some issue as to whether or not some things we're seeing are signal or noise or whether or not technical artifacts are masking uh, actual signal that may be associated with the sample. At the end of the day, I think it's important for you to realize that, again, this does come from a real case. And in fact, the person who was convicted ultimately of this particular crime was none other than Dick. Uh, in our series of four individuals here, Dick's DNA profile is the one that we see. Uh, his real DNA profile for this particular case is shown on this particular slide. And so Dick was the defendant in the case when the analyst from the crime laboratory came to talk about this particular DNA evidence, they were asked some very pointed questions. One of those questions was, can you exclude Dick as a possible contributor to the evidence sample? And they truthfully answered no, they could not. They were then asked an interesting and again perhaps deliberately pointed question. That question was, can you tell us how rare Dick's DNA profile is in the Caucasian population within the United States? The analyst truthfully answered that question, yes I can. They said, Dick's DNA profile is exceedingly rare. On the order of one in a quintillion individuals uh, would need to be looked at before you found another with Dick's DNA profile. The prosecutors at that point said they had no further questions. The defense didn't bother to cross-examine, thinking they would minimize the impact of the DNA evidence in the case by simply uh, ignoring it. And I think we need to stop for a moment and consider what it is the jurors heard. The jurors heard that Dick couldn't be excluded. The jurors heard that Dick's DNA profile was incredibly rare. What do you suppose their conclusion was? Their conclusion, and again, I think you've already figured this out, I've said Dick was convicted, their conclusion was that's Dick's DNA to the exclusion of all others. And I hope you're realizing that there's something wrong that's transpired here. The relevant question wasn't how rare is Dick's DNA profile, the question that really needed to be presented to the analyst from the laboratory and that the jurors needed to hear was, how impressed should we be that Dick can't be excluded? What fraction of the population would be similarly included? And from looking at this electropherogram in the context of these four different DNA profiles as we've been doing for the past few minutes, I think you should realize that uh, you shouldn't be that impressed at all. Four completely different people with different DNA profiles could all be included just as Dick as a possible contributor to the evidence sample. I've talked with a number of analysts after talking about uh, this particular electropherogram and uh, the alternative interpretations. And the, the, the actual impressiveness varies. I've had some say that they couldn't exclude anybody as a possible contributor. I've had others say that, oh, maybe one in 50, one in 100 people would be similarly included. But uh, nobody feels comfortable saying that one in a quintillion people would need to be looked at before you found somebody else who matched just as well as Dick did. And yet ultimately, that's what the jury heard, and ultimately Dick was convicted of this particular crime. And to my knowledge, he's still serving time in prison uh, for this particular offense. So what, are we, what can we learn from the ex from this exercise of talking about Tom, Dick, Harry, and Sally? Well, the short answer is that I think it's clear there are some opportunities for interpreting DNA testing results in a subjective fashion. It's not always as black and white and cut and dry as the TV shows might make you think. Uh, sometimes there are judgment calls that come into play. And where judgment calls come into play, that lessens the scientific reliability of the test results, but it also starts to get us into the realm not so much of DNA profiling as psychology. So let me introduce you to a term uh, on this next slide called observer effects, sometimes known as context effects. These are things that psychologists have been studying for decades, and this is the definition that they've come up with 
um, for the idea of an observer effect or a context effect. And I'll just read you the definition straight off of the slide. It's simply this, the tend uh, an observer effect is the tendency to interpret data in a manner consistent with the expectations or prior theories. Uh, and again, sometimes this is called examiner bias. That's what's in play here with the Tom, Dick, Harry, and Sally case. We're interpreting the evidence sample in a way that we probably shouldn't have been. We've been paying attention to the subject of the investigation when we think about Tom, Dick, Harry, and Sally's DNA profile and not just the object. And let's think about the context here. The analysts have been told that Dick is a suspect. And so that in and of itself telegraphs that Dick may well be a contributor to the evidence sample. So when is it that context effects come into play? Well, let me play a little bit of a uh, mental exercise game with you here. Let's consider this next slide. And I want to ask you what you see in that middle character, right? You see an A, you see a C. What's the thing in the middle? Well, I've been priming you, I suppose, with what I've said for the last minute, but uh, th such that you may want to act contrarian and tell me that it's something other than a B, but I think in a normal context, if you saw an A and a C and something in between, you would be inclined to say fairly agreeably that the thing in between is a B, all right? The context is helping us resolve some ambiguities in terms of what that character might be. but. Let's consider this. So if we go back to the slides here, and instead of looking at it in this presentation, let's look at it this way. Now, what is it that you see in that middle character? All right, there's a 12, and, and then somewhere beneath that is a 14. What's the thing in the middle? The thing in the middle for most normal people who don't want to be contrarian would be a 13 because the context is helping us resolve what it is that's going on in that middle state, that ambiguity there. Could that be a B? Could it be a 13? How often do you encounter the series 12B14? It seems fairly reasonable to use the context in this circumstance to tell us that that middle character is not a B here, but is actually a 13. But of course, if you look at it in the complete context, as we have on this particular slide, you'll see that that middle character hasn't changed. The only thing that's been changing is the context in which we see that middle character. And this is where context effects really come into play. Context effects are great tools that we use to help us resolve ambiguities. As human beings, it's in our nature to take into account the context in which we see something that's ambiguous and use that context to figure out what it is that's really in play there. That sort of thing was a great benefit to our hunter-gatherer ancestors in the distant, path, distant past. Uh, if you saw one delicious fruit and another delicious fruit and something in between them, what did you decide? Well, it seemed reasonable. It served us well to presume that if you see something flanked by two delicious fruits, the thing in the middle is a delicious fruit. If the thing on either side is a clearly poisonous object, well, stay away from the thing in the middle. Context effects are deeply rooted in our judgment processes, and they're really very hard to set aside. So that's what context, effect is, uh, context effects are all about. Um, when is it that context effects are most problematic? Well, they arise the most when we're dealing with things that are ambiguous. There has to be some ambiguity. In the context of a DNA profiling analysis, if you're talking about a reference sample uh, where everything is very unambiguous, where peaks are clearly present or absent, there's little opportunity for context effects to give rise to mistaken conclusions. But We've seen now from this exercise with Tom, Dick, Harry, and Sally that often evidence samples have ambiguity associated with them. And how do we resolve those ambiguities? Well, there's a natural human tendency to resolve those ambiguities in a way that takes information from the context. Here, the fact that the suspect, Dick, was accused of a particular crime. Okay. 
There's one other circumstance that really causes context effects to be in play, right? There has to be some ambiguity, but in addition to ambiguity, it's important that there be, in fact, some motivation for the person who's doing the evaluation to arrive at one conclusion as opposed to another. In the context of DNA testing, we're talking here about the analysts need to be biased. There needs to be some reason that they want to arrive at one conclusion as opposed to the others, to set aside alternative interpretations and simply gravitate to the one that they're motivated to arrive at. And I think it's reasonable at this point for viewers of these videos to say, gee, well, why would an analyst have any ax to grind against a particular suspect? Why would they want to resolve these results in a way that worked to a suspect's disadvantage? They don't even know the suspects in the vast majority of cases. Is it reasonable to presume that they have some motivation to inculpate them, to link them to a crime when the evidence doesn't support that linking? Well, let me ask you to consider this. I'm gonna ask you to read through a uh, fairly wordy slide here, uh, but this comes from an actual case, uh, the actual case file. I think it's important for people to realize that uh, during the course of DNA testing, before the test results are obtained, often before the evidence even begins to be analyzed, uh, analysts will be engaged in conversations with law enforcement personnel and they'll keep records of what they uh, learn during the course of those conversations and include them in the case file. This comes from such a case file and what we see here is an analyst before they began to isolate DNA from a sample uh, was talking with a district attorney and they learned this information and this comes straight from their case file. I asked how they got their suspect He's a convicted rapist in the MO, for those of you who aren't attorneys, that's modus operandi, the, the way that the person normally behaves. Uh, the MO matches the former rape. The suspect was recently released from prison and works in the same building as the victim. She was afraid of him. Also, his demeanor was suspicious when they brought him in for questioning. He also fits the general description of the man witnesses saw leaving the area on the night they think she died. The analyst then concludes, so I said, you basically have nothing to connect him directly with the murder unless we find his DNA. And the district attorney here said yes. Uh, the analyst was right. If you look carefully at what was being written down in her notes there, all of that information was hearsay. The fact that the analyst, uh, the fact that the victim was afraid of the defendant, uh, the fact that the witnesses uh, said that they looked, that the defendant looked something like the person that was at the scene of the crime, none of that would likely be admissible in court. And the analyst was right in summing things up, saying that unless we find a DNA profile match here, none of the the rest of that is likely to secure a conviction. And they received some affirmation from the, uh, the law enforcement official here, a district attorney, telling them that yes, indeed, if you don't help us with generating uh, a, a DNA profile match, this individual uh, is likely to not be found guilty of this particular crime. And so there we may have some motivation. What do you think the analyst is likely to be motivated to find in this case? They, they've got some reasonably good indications that the suspect is guilty from what the uh, law enforcement individual has shared with them. Uh, don't you think it would make them feel good about their work and themselves if maybe they were able to help things along and take this dangerous individual, apparently a rapist and now possibly a murderer, off the streets? Uh, I think there may well be here some potential for some serious motivation on the part of the analyst. But whether you agree with me about that or not, let me also ask you this, and let me draw your attention back to the slide, because is there anything that this analyst has written down here that she needs to know in order to be able to perform her DNA profile analysis. Is it imp do you suspect that the analyst working in the crime laboratory uses a different test kit when they're analyzing DNA that comes from somebody who was recently released from prison? I doubt it. Do you think that maybe they use different statistical approaches when the victim was supposed to have been afraid of the potential suspect? Uh, certainly not. 
None of that information is something that the analyst actually needs to have in hand. And yet, nonetheless, it's typically provided and it's available for the analysts to, to have in hand as they're contemplating the interpretation of the evidence samples. Again, whether you agree with me or not that it's providing motivation to the analyst, I think we can all agree that it's extraneous, it's irrelevant for the purposes of the DNA test. There's no need for the analyst to have that type of information. Let's look at another excerpt from a separate case file, another case file. Uh, here, this one comes from the state of California. The analyst has written down the following in their lab notes, again, before any DNA isolation ever took place. The analyst here writes down, the suspect is a known Crip gang member keeps skating on charges. I suppose they meant to write allegedly skating, but uh, you know that's, that's being picky -yoon. Uh, But the, the suspect here keeps skating on charges, never serves time. This robbery, he gets hit in the head with bar stool, left blood trail. The deputy DA wants to connect this guy to the scene with DNA. Again, do you suppose that the analysts in California use different extraction buffers when they're dealing with Crip gang members as opposed to blood gang members? Highly unlikely. Uh, do you suppose that if the, the suspect has been skating on charges that they uh, look at the evidence in one way different than if the individual had served time and paid his debt to society? Certainly not. Once again, we have potential here for some motivating information that would help an analyst feel that it was right for them to resolve ambiguities in one way as opposed to another, and yet this information is not necessary for the performance of the tests that they've been asked to do, and yet, again, very routinely provided. Let me draw your attention back to the slide because there's actually more to the notes here that I want you to see. A little further down on the same page, the analyst has written this down as well. This is a death penalty case. Obviously, needs some special attention. They need to eliminate item number 57, the reference from another individual as a possible suspect in the case. Why? Well, surely you don't want to include 57 as a possible contributor to the evidence sample. That individual might get executed if you make a wrong inclusion of his DNA. But I think, you know, and there, I, I can't help but smile here, I can't help but think that uh, if I was the Crip gang member, I would want that same care, that same zeal applied to excluding the individual whose reference was 57 to excluding me as a possible contributor to the evidence sample. And yet, nonetheless, I think you can see from, again, what's going on in this particular uh, dialogue, in this particular slide, there seems to be quite a bit of guiding of finding that this individual is the source of DNA in the evidence sample and not this particular individual that's described a little further down in the notes. If there are no ambiguities to the blood stain that they have to test, uh, that biasing information might not be important. But if there is ambiguity, I think I have a pretty good feel in terms of which way those ambiguities will be resolved in light of the information that the analyst has been provided that, again, they really didn't need to know. So, what we've been talking about here, then, is the fact that Analysts' expectations, these observer effects, may lead them to resolve ambiguities in a way that's consistent with those expect expectations. That sort of bias may unintentionally or intentionally cause them to miss or disregard evidence of alternative interpretations of the test results. And at the end of the process, that type of bias, that type of subjective interpretation undermines the scientific validity of the conclusions that could have come from an otherwise very robust set of data that comes from DNA testing results. If you'd like to learn more about this particular line of thinking and the problems associated with analyst interpretations and biases, I highly recommend the paper that you see cited at the bottom of this slide. Uh, it comes from the California Law Review, and it's become really a landmark of the implications of observer effects in all forensic science, not just DNA profiling. 
like the other materials that I've talked about for these videos, that's an article that you'll find uh, on the bioforensics.com website uh, that you could read at your leisure. All right, so what do we do about this problem of examiner bias? Well, about five or six years ago, a group of scientists, myself included, got together in a, a crowded room in uh, downtown Washington, D.C. to talk about what we thought was the biggest problem that was facing forensic DNA profiling at the time. And that is, quite simply, these examiner biases, the resolution of ambiguities in ways that didn't seem to be based on the data but were rather very subjective in nature. And what we came up with was this idea called sequential unmasking, as you see here in this particular slide. The idea behind sequential unmasking is really very simple. Evidence samples should be interpreted by analysts without any knowledge of the reference profiles for the suspects or the victims of a particular case. Quite simply, look at the evidence sample, determine what alleles the analyst is confident are present, determine what alleles the analyst is confident are not present, and make a note of those. Then, at that point, unmask that potentially biasing information, the information that comes from the victim's profile, the information that comes from the suspect's profile, and look to see if those individuals could in fact be included or excluded as possible contributors to the evidence sample. Now at that point, there's nothing wrong with an analyst saying, ah, now that I see the suspect's DNA profile, I want to revise my thinking about the evidence sample, so long as they make a note of that revision and so long as it's clear how they had interpreted it before. Because I think anybody would appreciate that now we're going to attach less weight to their inclusion than we would uh, if we hadn't had that revision in the interpretation once the suspect's profile was known. Doesn't mean there should be no weight, just means there should be less weight. The nice thing about this is that essentially what we're talking about doing with sequential unmasking is asking analysts to interpret evidence samples in a blind fashion. And I think everybody in the United States appreciates the, the value of blind testing. It happens with drug trials all the time. Uh, we hear about all sorts of blind tests going on in that context. It's clearly a good idea. And the nice thing, too, is that if the analyst is blind to that information, it doesn't matter how much motivation they have to include the suspect or not. Um, so that if, we can, if we're confronted by a sample like the one we've been talking about with Tom, Dick, and Harry and Sally, uh, it doesn't matter if they have been prodded and poked to make Dick look like he matches. They won't know which way they have to go. And what's going to happen, I think, is that the analysts are going to be forced to be very conservative. What do they do about the 12? Well, if they don't know what the suspect's profile is, they may simply have to say, I don't know if there's a 12 or a not. I know there's a 17. I'm going to exclude anybody who doesn't have a 17. I may or may not include them if they have a 12. That sort of thing will be captured and written down, and it will end up being a conservative estimate as opposed to the one that just builds a case against the suspect. And at this stage, again, it doesn't matter if we can't fix the problem of feeding analysts information that might skew their opinion one way or the other. Uh, I don't know why it is that an analyst needs to know that the suspect was a Crip gang member. I don't know why the analyst needs to know that uh, the, the suspect here has never served time. Uh, conceivably, that might be important in some circumstance. I don't want to be the one who judges. but. If that is important information, analysts can have it. They can use it as best as they like, as much as they like, just so long as they don't have the reference profile of the suspect to go along with it. Because now, no matter how motivated they might be that this is a death penalty case, for instance, uh, no matter how motivated they may be, uh, they will have no choice but to be conservative and objective in their interpretation of the test results. And so, uh, let's talk then about what it is that we've discussed here today. I think there is a solution to the examiner bias problem that's 
occurs within the context of forensic DNA profiling. Sequential unmasking should fairly neatly solve that problem. Uh, I'll go on to tell you that at this point, again, the idea first came out about five or six years ago. There is a movement within cr the crime laboratory community to move toward sequ sequential unmasking. There are several state laboratories within the United States, uh, the, the Virginia Department of Forensic Science, perhaps first among them, to adopt blind testing and sequential unmasking as part of their protocols. There are others uh, that do the same. And yet, by the same token, I think it's important to bear in mind that there are some states where there's resistance to doing blind testing. There are crime laboratories that tell us, that tell me when I talk with them, that it actually helps them to know the suspect's DNA profile simply because it helps them better arrive at the right answer meaning that it helps them to know if something that they've seen in an evidence sample is signal or noise or a technical artifact. Now again, I, I sort of shake my head when I hear this because that's the very thing that I'm trying to avoid, using information from the subject to resolve ambiguities in the object, and yet analysts tell me that that's something that they do and that they relish. They think that's a useful, helpful tool for them to have in hand. I tell you what, I think that is tantamount to this scenario. I think it's the same as a student in one of my biology classes that I teach at Wright State University coming to me before an exam and telling me, Professor Crane, I know you want me to do well on this test. I want to do well on this test. Here's what I figured out. If you give me the answer key before I take the test, I'm going to do much better than if I have to work my way through the test without the answer key, without knowing what it is the right answers are. Uh, that's, such a student would clearly be correct, uh, but I think everybody would appreciate that that fairly defeats the purpose of testing just as an analyst having a suspect's DNA profile to help them resolve ambiguities in an evidence sample defeats the purpose of generating DNA profiles uh, as part of a tool for criminal justice. So, sequential unmasking, blind testing may well be the solution to this particular problem. Let me leave you with a question. Is this something that's just an issue for forensic DNA profiling? Uh, I think there might be some real potential here for sequential unmasking to solve problems not just in blind testing, not just with DNA profiling, but all of forensic science. Handwriting analysis, fingerprints, uh, trace fiber analysis, all of those sorts of things may well benefit from that same type of blind interpretation of test results. And with that thought, let's wrap up this particular video. Uh, what I've been talking with you about is how it is that observer effects can help individual analysts uh, become subjective in their interpretation of DNA testing and how that subjectivity in turn can contribute to the lessening of the weight of uh, to, to the weight uh, that gets attached ultimately to a DNA testing result. Thanks very much.